Today we're going to pick up with cancer and control of the cell cycle. But before we do that, I want to do one more quick run through of mitosis. So just a couple of reminders. Mitosis is a way that cells make exact copies of themselves. Eukaryotic cells make exact copies of themselves, like your skin cells, your blood cells. This is for growth of the organism, replacing cells that die, allowing cells, um, organisms to reproduce asexually. So also, um, one of the things that came up was how come they're always drawing four chromosomes in the cell? Not all cells have four chromosomes. Remember, our cells have 46. But I wanted to clarify that every species has a specific chromosome number. Um, so our diploid number, the number of chromosomes when they're all paired up, because we have two copies of each one, is 46. But horses have a different number. Uh, fruit flies have like eight. Um, some species of corn, I think, have over 300 chromosomes. So depending on the species, the number of chromosomes is going to differ. So when you see these cells and they always draw four chromosomes, it's not because they're, you know, every cell has four. It's not true. Um, they're using four because by drawing four, it's enough chromosomes that you can see what's going on, but it's not so many that it's really crowded and difficult to follow what's going on. If we drew a human cell, there's 46. When you see real film footage of the onion root cell um, mitosis, the chromosomes are all piled on top of each other, so you really can't see the individual X-shaped chromosomes because there's so many of them. So that's why we're drawing four for simplicity. So here's interface. So really quick, let me go through and do some quick labels of all the parts that we would be looking at here. So this is the chromosomes all coiled up into, or sorry, uncoiled, I should say. Um, they're like a stringy mass called chromatin. When they coil up, that's when they're going to actually look like chromosomes. The DNA is going to coil very tightly, and then you'll see chromosomes. These are called centrioles. When the cell divides, these are going to move to opposite sides. Plant cells do not have these. That's why I commented that this is an animal cell, because actually plant cells don't have centrioles. This is the nucleolus, this black thing here. It has nothing to do with cell division, but it's one of the first things that's going to happen is that that's going to disintegrate. And this is the nuclear membrane, which is also going to disintegrate when the cell starts to divide. And we are not drawing all the other cell parts, but they're still there. We're just not drawing them because the focus of cell division is going to be on the chromosomes, so we're focusing on that. But in reality, there are mitochondria, the rough ER, the Golgi bodies, the ribosomes. All those parts are still there. We're just ignoring them because, again, it would distract from what's going on. All right, so let's walk through this really quick. So in prophase, here's what's going to happen. Our nucleolus is going to disappear. The nuclear membrane is going to break down. And these chromosomes are going to start coiling up really tightly whoops, so that you can actually see them. So they're going to now start looking like actual X-shaped chromosomes. They look kind of thick because what's really happening is these thin, long pieces of string are now coiling super, super, super tight, and they're taking up a lot less space as a chromosome. That's so that the chromosomes can get passed on without anything getting damaged or lost in the process. Those centrioles are also going to start moving towards opposite sides. So you're going to see the centrioles sort of start heading towards, they're going to call those two sides poles, and you're going to see these spindle fibers start to appear. Or sometimes it's called the spindle apparatus. So these lines are going to sort of start coming across the cell. And so I have one more picture of prophase I'm going to draw here. So by the end of prophase, we now have our four chromosomes. Again, we're just using four as a sample. They haven't moved to the middle yet or anything like that. The nucleus is completely gone. And our centrioles are on opposite sides. And our spindle fibers are almost completely formed across the middle. So this is our spindle, sometimes called the spindle apparatus. Or if you see, just FYI, if you see um, microtubules, that's what the spindle fibers are made of. Is a, um, they're made of a part of the cytoskeleton called microtubules. So that's not incorrect either. Uh, but we do call these spindle fibers. All right, now we're at metaphase. So now in metaphase, this is the part where 
the chromosomes actually line up in the middle. So you'd have one, two, three, here's our four chromosomes lined up perfectly in the middle. That middle is sometimes called the metaphase plate, or in our notes, we call that the equator. We call these two ends poles, where the centrioles are, and these spindle fibers, now not all of them are connected to chromosomes. You're actually going to see there's extra ones that are not connected to chromosomes in a real cell. In fact, you might even see some little short ones like that. Um, here's the important thing, though. The spindle fibers are attached to the center of each of these chromosomes, which is called the centromere. So don't mix up centriole and centromere. So this is the, the thing that's holding the two chromatids together. So we, in fact, if we take a quick step backwards and I was to sketch for you a chromosome. Remember, a chromosome starts off like this before S. And then during S phase of the cell cycle, it makes a copy of its information so that when the cell divides, each new cell will have a copy. And those two sides were called chromatids. And this is the centromere that's holding those two sides together. So this is pro, uh, metaphase. Anaphase, these chromosomes are actually going to start moving to opposite sides. So the spindle fibers pull, they really should probably be facing that way because they're being pulled by their middle. They are going to get pulled to opposite sides of the cell. So imagine now, here's our spindle fibers that are shortening. These are still here and here. And you can imagine that over the next few frames, if this was animated, these would get shorter and shorter and the chromosomes would be moving to opposite sides. And then our last stage is telophase. And at the same time as telophase, usually cytokinesis forms. Now technically there would only be one centriole in each of these cells, right? Because the two are on opposite sides. They actually make a copy of themselves during G1, um, back when the cell goes back into the original cell cycle again. Um, so if it's a plant cell, now the difference in cytokinesis is animal cells are going to pinch apart. They have these, um, again, they're called microfilaments, and they made out of the uh, actin and myosin, and this pinches the cells apart. And here you get instead a cell plate in plants. But the nucleus would look the same. The spindle fibers would go away. And the chromosomes would not look like X's anymore. You would have four, but they would look like little sticks. And they would go back uh, by the end of this to being chromatin again, the stringy stuff. And the nucleolus would reform and all of that. And uh, one thing I don't think it was in the notes, but you should know this. The offspring of this are called daughter cells. So we make two daughter cells from one original cell. So hopefully if you were a little confused on what was happening in those stages, this is kind of one more walkthrough of it. All right, so very quickly, um, what controls cell division? Well, in a lab, it turns out if you were to grow cells, cell tissue, uh, in a Petri dish, when they start touching each other, the cells stop dividing. And we've discovered that there's these chemicals that tell the cells when to divide and when not to divide. These are called growth factors. Uh, and in the cell, there's specific growth factors called cyclins that tell the cell at certain checkpoints, yes, progress, go ahead and go into synthesis, or S, go ahead and go into mitosis, or they tell the cell not to. So if you had two cultures of cells, and they're explaining that one of them has kind of large cells that don't seem to have divided very much, and the other one is covered with a bunch of little cells, um, you know, what might be a hypothesis for why they're different? Well, remember, all of the cell division we're about to talk about is controlled by chemical signals either internal or external signals. So they obviously are getting different signals. One is getting a signal to grow larger. The other one is getting a signal to grow, uh, to reproduce more often. This is just showing you that this is the cells. They're anchored in a dish. You'd have to give them nutrients and things, of course. You can't just, like, flake off some skin cells in a dish and have this happen. If some cells are taken out, the spot fills in, but then they stop. This is what's happening with cancer. They keep growing. They keep dividing, and they're not supposed to. Um, this is showing, again, external growth factors can be added, little chemical signals, and that will tell the cells to divide. So what regulates the cell cycle? 
couple things. Um, there are these checkpoints, and there are these chemical signals. There are special proteins in the cell called cyclins, and they control cell division. Now, if there's no signal at G1, remember there's, there's a checkpoint here. So we have G1, we have S, G2. And there's one of the checkpoints is here at the end of G1. If no signal is, is given to tell the cell to go to S, the cell will enter something called G0, like brain cells. And in brain cells, those cells no longer divide because it, they still do all the other jobs of cells. They just don't divide. And so, and the reason why they stop here is because, remember, the point of S was to make an extra copy of the genetic information. If, if the cell's never going to divide again, there's no reason to make an extra copy. I only need to make an extra copy of my notes if I'm going to give them to somebody. And so that's called G0. And some cells can leave G0. Sorry for the writing on top of that. Um, like liver cells, they're in G0, but then they can come out of it, go back, and divide if they need to. Um, this is just showing that if they take some of the chemicals from a cell that's in the middle of mitosis and insert it into a cell that's not dividing, that cell will actually be stimulated to start dividing. So that's one of the ways they discovered some of these chemicals. Is they said, wow, there's some kind of chemical in the dividing cell that if I put it in the non-dividing cell, it sends a signal and tells the cell to start dividing. Um, you have internal regulators. Again, this is things going on inside, like if there's damage to the DNA. The cells are basically told by internal signals, hey, there's damage to the DNA, do not reproduce. In some cases, as a matter of fact, the cell will receive a signal to die, that the uh, lysosomes will digest the cell to protect the organism from that cell becoming cancerous. External factors happen, uh, also tell a cell what to do. For example, again, if you have a cut, signals will send be sent to the cells in that area saying, hey, we need to form some scar tissue to heal the damage of this cut. So there's internal signals and there's external signals. But the bottom line is it's just factors that control cell division. And these are some of the checkpoints they're showing you. So if there's a problem with the DNA or something like that, a cell might be told not to go past this point. If more cells are needed, it might tell the cell to progress. At which of those checkpoints would the chromosomes be sister chromatids? Well, if we go back, remember in G1, the chromosomes are just sticks. So definitely not here. During S, the chromosomes would now form those Xs, and they would stay that way in G2. So at this checkpoint, the G2 checkpoint, the chromosomes would consist of two chromatids. They would be duplicated chromosomes. By the time you get to the end of mitosis, they've split again. So they would not be duplicated there. And this is just showing uh, an example, this is kind of complicated, you don't have to know it, of how growth factors could be set, uh, send a signal to a cell to tell it to either divide or not divide. So what cancer is, a tumor, is where cells are dividing uncontrolled. Why are they doing that? Because there's, there's something wrong with that whole signaling process. Um, the protein that's supposed to be checking for damage isn't checking correctly, so the cell is dividing when it should have basically gone through apoptosis. Uh, the cell is making too much of the cyclins that are telling it to divide, so it's just dividing all the time. A lot of times this is because of mutations, some kind of carcinogens, things like ultraviolet light, x-rays, um, mustard gas, uh, chemicals from smoking can cause damage to the DNA that screws up the cell cycle. The reason that chemotherapy works, radiation chemotherapy, they, they stop cells, they kill cells that are dividing. And since cancer cells are pretty much just dividing and doing nothing else, it's going to hurt the cancer cells more than it would hurt any normal cell. But you are going to have some damage to your normal cells too, because some of your normal cells are dividing sometimes, like the cells making your hair, or blood cells, for example. Um, and this is breast tissue, and they're showing a tumor. So it starts off in one little location, but if the person doesn't find it, because it may be very tiny, it may start to spread, and metastasis, or malignant cancer, is where this would break off and actually travel to other parts of the body. And the reason tumors are so dangerous is that these cells themselves, they're probably not making any toxic products or anything, but the problem is they are taking up space, and they start squashing and damaging 
and using up all the blood supply for the good cells around them. Especially if you had, say, brain cancer, where the tumor's growing and it's crushing brain cells, you might start having seizures or have paralysis or blindness or something like that. So that's where we'll stop.